through the first Hi everyone. Um, like Don said, my name is Gretchen Guffey. I am on the assessment team with Don and Kathy Banks. Um, I'm going to turn my video off right now, um, but would encourage uh, folks as you have questions along the way, please feel free to put them in the chat. We'll be monitoring them and pausing to, to try to answer questions that you have along the way. So as Don said, this is the first in our series of webinars. Um, today is a broad overview of the assessment peer review process. And um, for some of you, this will be very familiar. For others, it may be the first time. Um, but I really, uh, at least through my portion of this, even if you know all of, all of this information, I encourage you to wait um, until we get to our peer reviewer panelists. Um, which, Don, if you can move the slide forward. Um, our Vince Burgess from the Department, uh, Florida Department of Education. He's the Assistant Deputy Assistant Commissioner. We also have Fran uh, Warkomsky. She is the former Director of Special Education for Pennsylvania. Department of Education, also a former professor and executive director at the Florida Institute for Technology and a current consultant. And we have Tracy Hembry, who is the director of education and a senior psychometrician at Alpine Testing Solutions. All of these panelists have our, our seasoned peer reviewers, and we uh, really think they'll have some important insights to share as we move into the second part of the presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So part one, again, we'll do an overview of the process and then move into part two where Vince, Fran, and Tracy will provide their perspective on initial submissions and then resubmissions of assessments for the peer review process. Next slide. So first, just a level set, we wanna make sure we're all on the same page about the purpose and the role of peer review. Um, it's to support states in meeting the statutory requirements under Title I and ESEA, to ensure states develop and implement valid and reliable coherent state assessment systems, to review and document the assessment system's technical quality, and to ensure that assessment results are applied in a manner that's consistent with professional standards. So I likely don't need to tell all of you this, but just again, to level set and make sure we're all on the same page, here are the things that need to be peer reviewed or the assessments that need to be peer reviewed. General math and reading language arts for grades three through eight and in high school general science, uh, which needs to be administered at least once in each of the uh, following grade spans, three through five, six through nine, and in high school. Alternate assessments in mathematics, reading, language arts, and science for students with the most significant cognitive disabilities for each of the grades described above. And then English language proficiency assessments for all English learners, and grades K through 12 and the alternate uh, ELP assessments for the English learners with the most significant cognitive disabilities also in grade K through 12. So there are a couple of um, flexibilities within ESSA, um, which we wanna point your attention to. This would not apply to all assessments or all states, but in some cases, if applicable, um, states will need to submit their locally selected nationally recognized high school academic assessment. Uh, states that are, are using um, an advanced high school assessment for um, students in eighth grade will also need to submit uh, that assessment for peer review. And content assessments in the student's native language for English learners, as well as content assessments in a Native American language also need to be peer reviewed. So I know this slide is kind of tiny, the font it is, that, that, I mean, the font is tiny, but I think we're trying to lay out here 
some of the big milestones in the submission through final decision uh, process. And we'll go through each of these in more detail in the next slide, in the next slides. But just so we're all um, on the same page with where we start, typically states will start to prepare evidence um, for all of the six critical elements or possibly seven if the local assessment applies to you and your state. Um, and they will submit, start preparing that evidence and submit it for um, the, they'll start, they'll, they'll start preparing the evidence in summer and fall and then get ready to submit that evidence for a winter peer review, for example. So states would then submit that evidence to us, to the department through their max.gov portal. Again, we'll go through that in a minute. And then once all that information is in the, in the portal, uh, state's evidence is removed by a panel of three to four peer reviewers. Once those peer reviewers are done with their review, that is finalized by the department. And then the department sends the decision letter to states indicating whether or not the assessment fully meets, substantially meets, partially meets, or does not meet the, the um, the requirements. And that typically happens in a summer, in the summer, if the peers were reviewing the assessment the previous spring. Once states get that letter, they will prepare their follow up evidence. Um, but first, they need to respond to the department within 30 days with a plan or a timeline to meet those remaining elements does not mean that they have to resubmit all of the evidence. It just means that we need to have, or we need to talk through the plan for submitting that evidence moving forward. And then once that's established, then the process kind of starts all over again. And then the state would submit the follow-up evidence um, typically in the following spring for a summer peer review. Next slide. So as a state, starts to prepare evidence. Um, this is sort of the, the Bible of peer review um, guidance. You would make sure that you have this information and this, um, this guidance on hand. And you will use this to, or states will use this to uh, identify all the evidence they have that aligns to the critical elements. And then they will write in or provide notes and guidance that they think will be helpful for the peers as they are um, reviewing the evidence. Next slide, please. Here we have all of the critical elements for the state assessment peer review process. Um, it's too small to read. I'm not going to read them, but I think what we want to highlight here is that when states prepare the evidence, there will be a mixture of evidence that is state specific, um, evidence that would be supplied by or supported by the vendor or the consortium um, that the state is a part of. And there's some hybrid um, evidence, so some evidence that would be both the state and the vendor, um, but that really will depend on, on the actual assessment. So we really just want to highlight that there is a variety or there's a different, there are different components of the, of the process or of the, of, the, um, of the guidance and some of the, some of the elements will be state specific and some will be more consortium specific. And the next slide will highlight that. So, Consortium um, need to, or will the process will be used for academic assessment consortium will be applied to the ELP assessment consortium. So that's WIDA or ELPA. Um, for example, the alternate assessment consortia, for example, DLM or Cambium and or general assessment consortia such as Smarter Balanced. Again, the common evidence um, signifies items for the consortium, and that is reviewed by one panel of the peers. So for example, if a state is submitting using a consortium test, say, I'm just gonna pick on one, uh, it's for SBAC. SBAC will have provided or has gone through, will have gone through um, its own peer review, or there will be a panel of peers reviewing that common evidence. And then that evidence would be 
uh, used in the state specific uh, submission as well. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So here's an example um, where the state uh, where the state would have specific evidence that it would submit the vendor or both. Um, so we can see here the state specific evidence typically would be critical elements 1.1 through 1.5, 2.4, 5.1, 5.2, 6.1, 7.1, 8.1, 1, 5.2, 6.1, 7.1 through 7.3. The coordinated evidence for states would typically be 2.1, 2.2, 3.1 through 3.4, 4.1 through 4.7, 6.2 and 6.3. And so the hybrid evidence, which I mentioned earlier, would typically be 2.3, 2.5, 2.6, 5.3, 5 5.4, and 6.4. So these are just examples or suggestions based on what we've seen previously. Um, but that may really depend on, you know, your relationship or state's relationship with the vendor and what the vendor would submit or what the state would submit. But just to be clear, the state will always make the submission. Next, please. So this is just illustrative, just to point out that this is the, um, the portal that states use to upload evidence. Um, when it's time to upload the evidence, you will get a link to, or states will get a link to their max.gov page. And all of that is secure. And um, it's a portal that holds all of that evidence in one place. Um, and there will be specific instructions along the way to if you're not familiar with that process. But that's where all the evidence sits and exists. And once that evidence has been uploaded, you can turn to the next slide, please. Then the peer reviewers will start their review. So just to step back here, assessment peer review is conducted by external assessment experts. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the panelists on this call today are expert peer reviewers. Um, and they include, just as our panelists do, uh, nationally recognized assessment experts, state and local assessment directors, and educators. Reviewer panels for each state are anonymous, so um, it's never known who those peers are, but the list of approved peer reviewers is public. Each reviewer conducts an independent review first and then develops notes based on the evidence provided by the state. Then the review team meets um, typically one to two days and comes together, shares notes, and makes a collective recommendation based on each critical element. Next page, please, or next slide, please. So once the peers have, uh, have finalized their peer notes, um, the department then reviews that and provides formal feedback to the state regarding whether or not the state has provided sufficient evidence to demonstrate that the assessment meets the applicable statutory and regulatory requirements. In addition to the department identifying whether or not or which elements have been met or which elements still need additional evidence, the decision letter it also includes the peer notes to back to the states. There are some specific elements that only ed staff reviews, um, but it's also important to, to point out that the department is specifically prohibited from approving state standards and test items. Next slide, please. So the decision letter, as I mentioned, um, will be sent directly to the state and will inform the state whether or not it fully meets, substantially meets, partially meets, or does not meet the requirements. All of the decision letters are posted online. Um, if you're unfamiliar with them, um, you can take a look at them and just to get a sense of, of what they entail and what they include, but they are all posted online. Next page. 
So once states receive the letter from the department, it's important that states look at the table in the letter because that represents the official request for additional evidence. This obviously is assuming a state does not fully meet the requirements. Um, so the state will need to, to then start to consider what additional evidence it will need to provide the department in its resubmission. It's important to note that the table may not align completely with some of the recommendations that are made in the peer notes. Um, that doesn't mean that the peer notes are incredibly important and shouldn't be reviewed. They, they should and can be very helpful, but it's important that the state responds directly to the items in the table in the letter. Next slide. I already mentioned this, I'll mention it again. States are asked to provide a plan and a timeline within 30 days. Again, this is not a request for the evidence itself. It's a request for a timeline or an outline and a plan for how long or when the state anticipates being able to respond to the outstanding evidence request. We highly encourage um, states to request a phone call to discuss the results with us. Um, we're always happy to do that and talk through any questions or concerns. We also um, can provide states with more time to respond if necessary. Um, we really want to be seen as helpful in this process. And so we really encourage you to, to reach out to us um, for additional clarification or help with the response. We do prefer um, that all of the evidence comes in together, not piecemeal. So when you may have additional evidence to submit right away, but we want you to wait until all the evidence has been compiled and put together, and then you would um, submit during a, a typically a summer or a winter peer review, depending on where you are in the cycle. Next slide. So this is just another view um, timeline for the 2021-22 peer review. If you are a state and you are wondering, what should I be doing right now? If you have a test that's ready to be peer reviewed, um, and if you don't know, then you can certainly reach out to um, any of us and we can, we can talk through where you are along the different sort of um, the process in many of your assessments, because there are many assessments that need to be peer reviewed. But if you know that you do need to submit for peer review this fall, you should start preparing your submission now. So you should take out that, guide, that guidance book and um, start compiling that evidence. Um, then around mid-November, you will get an email from us. Um, you, should you will probably get an email from us before that confirming that you are in fact uh, planning to submit for the winter uh, 2022 peer review. But assuming you are, and we are all aware of that, then you should look for an email um, with your max.gov information. If you don't have a max.gov account yet, we will set you up with one. But we really think um, it works best when only one to two people have access to it, just so things don't get moved around and shuffled around too much. So that is something you can start to think about as well. So from November to December, that's when you're uploading your evidence. And then again, in uh, January to March, that's when the peer review actually would take place. During the peer review, it may be the case that there's a piece of evidence that's missing and we will reach out to you, the department will reach out to you um, for clarification or to ask you to upload evidence that the peers may have found to be missing or that's something that's not clear. Once their review is complete, we will prepare the peer review results. We'll send you that decision letter and talk with you about next steps. And we would likely expect 
if this all moves as planned, we would expect um, you to respond with a plan and timeline for collecting the additional evidence by the end of year 2021 um, or getting prepared to submit for summer 2022. Next slide. And now I'm going to hand it off to Vince and Tracy. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'll leave my video on for a second while I uh, introduce the next slide, if we could, slide 21. Um, I'm just going to spend the next, uh, the next following four slides kind of cover what I think about from a perspective as a state assessment director. Of course, as a state assessment director, we've also submitted for peer review. And um, I, you know, I think it's great that the USDOE in, uh, includes state assessment directors because we it gives us a little bit of insight into the process. And so we kind of help better understand how to prepare our submissions. Not to say that we've, we've provided excellent and, and you know, meeting expectations on the first try. We're still actually working through some iterations. But again, I think being part of the process allows us to, to, you know, to have that insight and to understand more of what you're looking for from that perspective. And I think we've, we've provided you know, better, better submissions and we've gotten successively better to get to at least substantially meeting expectations across our assessment. So with that, I'll just talk about some things. And I, I saw some of the attendees. It's great to have so many folks here. And a lot of folks I know I've known for you know, quite a while that are experienced state assessment directors. So some of the things I'll share will be apparent to some of you. Um, hopefully there'll be some things in here that you maybe haven't considered or folks that are new to the process will find that is helpful. So uh, with that, I'll close my video off to make sure I have a steady connection. Um, first, I'll talk about planning and scheduling. I know Gretchen talked about it from the department's perspective, but when I first looked at the size of, you know, what goes into a peer review, um, the peer review submission, all the numbers of critical elements and the pieces of documentation, I think you know planning far, much farther in advance, and, and laying out some of the tasks, especially some of the tasks that take time, and uh, and will occur at natural times of the year, and and certain tasks that shouldn't occur at certain times of the year. I'll get into that detail. Then I'll talk a little bit about the technical advisory committee. I think Florida, for one, we were we were a little bit slower on the uptake to, to involve our technical advisory committee. So I'll talk about. Uh, some some good practices and, and lessons learned there. Other resources as far as the um, the technical report, your contractors, you know, plural, whether you're part of a consortium or not, and then your special education and, and all your populations, and then some lesson learned that that we've seen as we've you know as we started with our general education, then moved to our alternate assessment, and then our English language proficiency assessment. Things to, to think about to make sure that your your submission is consistent and uh, some unified practices that help both you, know, you, your staff, and then the department and the peer reviewers. Uh, next slide. And I do. There's a question about the recording in the slide deck, and I know uh, these will. This is being recorded, and you'll have the slide deck as well. And of course, um, you can contact me directly if you have any questions about a state submission. Uh, as Gretchen mentioned, the peer review cycle does allow approximately a year for states to plan their submissions, and, and it's nice to know those timelines. You can think about things that you, you know, that you're that you're going to get done, um, and then knowing, obviously, as a state assessment director, when your test admin windows are, uh, the scoring activities that are going on, reporting, uh, building the next year's test. Oh, yeah, the, thanks. Uh, building next year's test and so forth, um, and then of course. When you get the evidence, or, or if you're looking for feedback, um, what kinds of things? If you're working with other offices, um, you know, getting getting those the feedback from the DOE and, and looking at your, you know, it, it, what you're doing to make sure that the things that you're doing aren't just for peer review, but um, you know, they're going to help you improve your system, which is the whole point of peer review. Uh, and then getting these things back to make sure that that the the work that you're doing on this peer review doesn't doesn't impact the other activities that you've got going on. Say, for example, you know, if you want to get, if you, you know, that part of your submission is going to be a, uh, a um, uh, alignment study, you don't want to, you know, if, you, if your alignment study includes subject matter experts, content experts, you're not going to schedule your alignment study during the middle of your spring testing window. Um, you're not going to task your psychometricians with things that are part of your peer review right in the middle of your scoring and scaling and equating activities. And, you know, so just thinking about what tasks occur naturally when 
Um, and then when, if you're, if you need things, if you need district surveys or districts respond to things about progress monitoring, that you're giving them enough time uh, so that you can work with those, those districts or those LEAs to give them the time they need to, to help implement their monitoring process, not while they're trying to get a testing window opened up or while they're planning for the start of the next year. And then so, you know, secondly, although you've got this long year, you wanna have some gates, you wanna have some check-ins, um, especially say for example, Florida's TAC meetings are in November. You've gotta say, what kind of things do I wanna have for the TAC in November that I need to have some studies completed for us to review the results of our, say for our alignment study, for example, or you're looking at some analyses that your contractor is doing on scoring and reporting, that those analyses are done in time for you to look at them, to go back and forth with the contractor and they get them you know, to the, to the technical advisory committee whenever they meet. So you need to follow those, those especially those long-term processes to make sure that the things that you need to get done are done by the time that you wanna have them. And similarly to having the gates that you don't, don't say, let's have a peer review, uh, get our peer review process started in January and don't touch it again until October, November. You want to have some check-ins with your contractor, either as part of your regular management discussions, you know, internal meetings to, to kind of check progress and see where you are and, and what needs to be done. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll, I'll also pause there. So planning and, and if, if Fran or Tracy have uh, anything to add there, uh, then you, know, you guys feel free to jump in there. So I mentioned the technical advisory committee. Definitely what you want to make sure you can give them a heads up, you know, not prior to the TAC meeting, right? Well in advance of the TAC meeting and say, uh, you know, just to let you know, we have a, you know, either an initial submission or updated submission for what, you know, a resubmission for what tests and what you plan to, um, you know, to, to when you plan to give them information and what that information is. Making sure that your technical advisory committee is also, uh, you've got expertise there. And if you're, you have anything, specific you want to run by your TAC as far as say for example you know sample sizes so subgroup sizes and so forth um, that you think about all those kinds of things uh, with respect to your technical advisory committee especially those members that, that specialize in, in the special populations um, as I mentioned previously getting that that lead time for TAC to weigh in on the methodologies I think for example alignment studies there's different ways to do that or different time kinds of dimensional analyses. You don't want to have your contractor working on analysis that you, that you have it run by your TAC. Uh, and, if, and if you want to have, you have a couple of options, make sure you have time to put together those options and the pros and cons of each option, uh, get them to, to the technical advisory committee beforehand. And of course, you know, that continuous monitoring and improvement, uh, in my experience, TAC members are interested in, in knowing uh, what the department had to say about your process, what the peers had to say about your process, what they requested, and then where you are in implementing their own feedback that, you know, technical advisory committee has their own feedback for their thoughts on what you're doing, as well as, uh, you know, your, your process in, in moving forward with, you know, with the improvements in the, in the implementation of the analyses that, that you're planning on. Um, and again, I'll make sure that those documentation includes your plan, what it is that you've ultimately decided to do and when you're going to do it. So it's important for the TAC to know, and that's important for peers to know. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, you know, feel free, Tracy or Fran, to jump in if you want to weigh in on any of those things there. As a peer reviewer, I've seen most people already do this. You get your technical report has sections. Uh, it may it may follow the organization of peer review, but certainly the contents should have sections that address all the uh, you know all the content of the peer review uh, guidance, and then make sure that again throughout whether you're you're submitting your alternate assessment or not, make sure that your technical report adequately addresses how you, uh, you measure achievement of student popu the special populations, including students with disabilities and your English learners. Um, and then uh, again, uh, you know, contractors, I think there's contractors uh, and, and consultants here. Um, clearly much of what assessment contractors do is already baked into what uh, you know, a good peer review submission looks like, but there's also, you know, it's, it, you know, these assessment contractors have time and management resources and there's a real cost 
to assessment or a contractor's participation in the peer review process. So make sure that not only your contract has the requirements in it that you have all the things that you want uh, that you want to have them helping you with peer review, but that you allow for the resources. You know, for example, if you're going to have them manage your alignment study, that you've got you've got the that's all in the in the scope of work, and there's cost allowances for doing those alignment studies or any other thing that requires this extra effort. Don't expect your contractor to do some things that are outside of normal processes. Uh, to do them for free or, you know, you know, with the manpower that they haven't allocated without, you know, specific requirements in the contract. And of course, as I know that most states already do, make sure that your contractor is there for your TAC meetings, that they're, whatever the TAC has to say about your processes or suggestions for something you haven't thought of, that the contractor is involved in, in those discussions and in the work itself. And then in a state like Florida, if, if many most states where your alternate assessment contractor is different from your other you know, general or ELP, make sure that you know, as, you, as you ramp up, especially if you've got a contractor that you haven't submitted for yet, you can say, listen, here's how Florida likes to do our assessments and here's or our peer review submissions. Here's how we've done our, our general ed submission. Here's how we want to you know, some things we want to transfer over to make sure that the, the alternate, the other contractors are following where appropriate a consistent pattern with uh, you know with, with your other submissions and your other work with your other contractors. So I'll pause there. The final slide that I'll discuss, we can go on to the next slide, is uh, as I mentioned, those lessons learned and, and you know best practices. As I mentioned, I think. Even I thought we had scheduled things very well. I, I realized I could have left more lead time for things. We've really gotten a much better. I think we've gotten better in Florida, uh, involving our technical advisory committee, changing things we put on our technical reports and some standard analyses that we haven't done in the past that we did as a result of, of peer review feedback. And then making sure that you, as I mentioned previously, that you've got some consistency to the greatest extent possible. And doing that, not only helps you and your job and helps keep in, in your mind straight, it helps you with your submission index. Uh, it helps the contractors, they can speak to each other or internally to, to see that you've got this consistent process. And of course, peers are looking at, sometimes you're looking at a, a resubmission, an initial submission, they're all in the same index. And you know, obviously there are differences across some assessment systems, but the, to the greatest extent possible, um, provide that consistency and at least in the process and, and handle things you know as, as consistently as you can to make sure that it's straight in everyone's mind you know what it is that you know that you're submitting and peers know what it is that you've given them um, and again I think I'll give my example for pre, uh, monitoring I thought we did uh, a great job in Florida monitoring I was thinking you know we've got a you know relative to the rest of the state, we have a small staff, but I think we've got one of the bigger assessment staffs um, in, in the country. Uh, and I just think that I think it well, we're doing a really good job in, in monitoring what's going on. But then looking at some of the what other states did and seeing what the, the peer review requirements are, we really hadn't done a great job monitoring. So we've got processes in place to do that and making sure that you communicate to everyone that you're not doing this to check a box. It's, this is not what this is for that you're helping them, uh, you know, you're helping them improve those processes. And again, that monitoring, we, the, the improvements and additions that we made for general education certainly apply to not only our ultimate assessment, but our English language proficiency assessment, even though we're part of the WIDA consortium, because again, that, that monitoring uh, of test administration is something that's, of course, the state's responsibility, not so much uh, WIDA's responsibility. Um, so again, I, I think we've gotten better at those, the consistency, the the making sure that you're you know you're you're moving towards those improved processes across all the assessment systems. I think whether although we haven't met requirements in all of our tests, I, I guarantee that the process has led to a, a better assessment system in the state of Florida. So um, I, with that, I will hand it off to our next presenter. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tracy Hembury. I'll introduce myself quickly here uh, before we go through the next slides. Uh, I am the Director of Education. I'm also a Senior Psychometrician for Alpine Testing Solutions. 
Um, and I have been serving as a peer in the peer review process for a number of years now. Uh, and uh, I think I've lost track of how many different states or consortium I've, I've been part of. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to kind of share some thoughts and experiences here with you today. Um, so, you know, I think Vince did a great job of speaking from the state perspective in terms of preparing materials for the submission. Um, and what I'm going to talk about here a little bit is, is to try and give you some insight in terms of how the peers as a panel review those submissions and some of the thinking that goes on, the process that we use to review the evidence that you all compile and submit as part of peer review. So as you're well aware, and as we've mentioned uh, earlier in this session, you know, there's a, a large number of critical elements. Um, and you know, we've really alluded to the fact that there's a lot to, to pull together for each of those critical elements. Um, but even looking within a critical element, I think it's really important to break it down. Um, and, and so specifically, you need to address all of the requirements within each critical element. You need to match the provided evidence to the requirement and understand the meaning of the requirement. And so I wanna, through an example, um, talk through these in greater detail. So if we can have the next slide, please. Thank you. So I know that the text is really small here um, and that's okay. Uh, I'll kind of talk you through it. This is meant to be illustrative. Um, so if you look at each of the critical elements, so here what you're seeing on screen, it's okay if you can't read it all. This is critical element 2.3 for test administration. You'll notice that there are three bullets within one critical element. And the way in which the peer uh, panel is gonna go through this is they're gonna take it one bullet at a time. And they're gonna look at each bullet individually and look at the evidence um, supplied by the state for critical element 2.3 and have some discussion around each bullet and has adequate evidence been um, supplied for each of those bullets within the critical element. So if we can have the next slide, we can talk about this in greater detail. Thanks. So um, I'm gonna read this since the font is small here, but the first bullet says, has established and communicated to educators clear, thorough, and consistent standardized procedures for the administration of its assessments, including administrations with accommodations. And so as a peer panel, what we're gonna do is not only within the critical element, are we gonna look at each bullet, but then we're gonna break that down um, and look at all of the requirements within each of the bullets of the critical element. So for this one here, the questions that we'll ask as a panel and discuss are, are there standardized administration procedures? Are they clear? Are they thorough? Do they include administration with accommodations? Are these procedures communicated to educators? Those are all of the things that are included within just this one bullet um, of this critical element. And that's really how the conversation is gonna go as the peer panel. We're gonna talk about each of those aspects of this one bullet. And so as you're preparing evidence, you wanna make sure that you're really looking at the critical elements and each of the aspects of it to ensure that you're providing evidence that supports each of those aspects, all of the requirements within the critical element. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so um, the next tip in breaking down the critical elements is to match the provided evidence to the requirement. So this, the second bullet within critical element 2.3 says, has established procedures to ensure that general and special education teachers, paraprofessional teachers of ELs, specialized instructional support personnel and other appropriate staff receive necessary training to administer assessments and know how to administer assessments. I apologize, I'm trying to read the small print here, including um, uh, alternate assessments and know how to make use of appropriate accommodations during assessments for all students with disabilities, right? So there's a lot in there. And so a lot of times what we'll see for this specific bullet within critical element 2.3 is the PowerPoint training 
Um, so the slides that you will provide um, when you have training sessions with educators who are going to administer the, the assessments. And that is fantastic. That shows that you have training materials, but it doesn't provide evidence if you look at what's underlined of ensuring that staff receive the necessary training. So the training presentation itself is gonna be one aspect. And then the, the, to completely address this bullet within the critical element, you'd also want to have some kind of evidence that demonstrates that the staff received the trainings. So sometimes it's a, you know, a log of participants or the number of trainings that were offered or, you know, so some kind of demonstration that not only do you have the training presentation prepared, but then you're also administering it and people are participating to get the necessary information. And so this is just um, another illustration of making sure that you're really looking at the critical element and what's required in the language and being sure that you provide the evidence that matches the, the requirement. If we go to the next slide, please. And then finally, this may seem kind of obvious, but you do need to understand the meaning of the requirement. Um, so within this third bullet here, and again, this is just an illustration or an example, but this says, if the state administers technology-based assessments, the state has defined technology and other related requirements included technology-based test administrations in its standardized procedures um, for test administration and establish contingency plans address possible technology challenges during its administrations. So it's a lot of language there. Um, and a lot of times what we see with this is that um, a state will rely on their vendor to um, provide kind of the technical requirements of running a computer-based assessment. And that is part of this, um, but something that is commonly overlooked is a contingency plan. And what that's getting at here is the way you read it is a contingency plan. If there's a technical difficulty during administrations, what will happen. And this is just, you know, that we're, as peers, we're trying to interpret what is in the critical element is exactly as it's written. And so being sure that you're also including some kind of contingency plan, the state hat and the vendor have put forth some thought about what if something happens during the administration, it could be a communication plan or, you know, how are you gonna let people know and address the issue? Um, but that's something that's commonly left out. And so again, it's really looking carefully at the language of the critical element, making sure you're addressing everything within the critical element, making sure the evidence that you provide aligns to what's in the critical element, and being sure that you understand what's being asked of the critical element and seeking clarification if you need to. Next slide, please. Okay. So a few other things just with regards to the, the perspective of the peer reviewers um, that I thought might be helpful to share with all of you. Um, as we sit in these uh, peer review meetings as a panel, um, the expectation from states is not perfection. And I think it's important to note that um, most of us who sit on these panels, either like Vince work currently for a state, uh, or work for a vendor or have been involved in the development of statewide assessments and also peer review submissions in one shape or another. And so there's an understanding and experience with this process, um, understanding the practical realities of putting these in place. And so I, I don't know if it's helpful, but to understand that it's, it, it doesn't have to be a perfect assessment. Um, it's about putting forth best effort um, and doing the best that you can with the um, circumstances that, that you're in. And then when it can't be as, you know, maybe there's a method that you can't use that your TAC recommended because logistically it's not feasible. It's just, you know, narrating that in the, in the narrative to say, we considered this, but went with this other one for some reason. Um, the other thing that I'll mention here is just don't forget to put in next steps and efforts of improvement. We commonly see that people will um, submit a study uh, to meet uh, a particular critical element. And um, there's not really any 
indication of how that study is informing what happens next within the assessment program. So for example, if you do an alignment study and there isn't perfect alignment, which is what happens, <laughs> I, you know, some kind of um, within the narrative or within the study write-up itself of saying, here's how we're taking that information and um, following up on it. Here's what our next steps will be um, to address whatever is, you know, not perfect within the program. Um, so that's something that I think commonly we see left out. I'll also mention, and I've kind of alluded to this, that it's okay and preferred to be transparent. So if there is a particular critical element or a particular study to support a critical element that you have not yet gotten to um, or are planning to get to and for some reason something happened and it got delayed, it's acceptable to say that you don't yet have the evidence, but you have a plan to collect it at some future date. You'll still need to supply that evidence at the future date. But rather than trying to, you know, put something together that isn't, you know, what you originally intended to see if it's going to fly through, um, I, it, I would certainly advocate for transparency. And then finally, I would recommend as you're pulling this together, obviously, it's a lot of information. Um, so as much as you can allocate time for review, I think it would be advantageous. Um, specifically, you want to check for completeness. Um, as I mentioned, it's not just making sure you have evidence for each critical element, but taking a deep dive within each critical element to see what's required and making sure that you're addressing everything within that. It's also helpful to provide sufficient program information. So um, obviously, you all live and breathe the programs in which you work. Um, and the peer reviewers, we receive a pile of evidence. And as Gretchen mentioned, we commonly have a day or two to review it. Um, so avoiding um, abbreviations or um, if there's some relevant program history that is pertinent to what's going on currently, making sure that you share that, recognizing that the peers don't have the same level of background knowledge that you all do. Um, and again, making sure that the connection between the critical element and the evidence that you've submitted is clear. So obviously, if the critical element requires an alignment study and you submit something called alignment study, that's pretty clear. But there are some other critical elements where we've seen states um, submit evidence and there isn't any kind of narrative to say why they feel like it's relevant. Um, and that leaves the peer sometimes trying to figure out why it is that a state feels that it, it supports the, the required evidence. Um, and then finally, when it comes to review, I think one way to get all of this review done, if it's possible, and obviously it's not always feasible, but if you have someone who is outside the program who can take some time and review what you've put together, just to make sure that you've provided the sufficient program background information and that you've, you know, kind of checked all the boxes as you go through, I think that that could be helpful as well. So with that, I believe that's the end of the slides that I'm addressing now. Pass it over to Fran. Well, good afternoon. Um, my name is Fran Morkomsky, and I was a, a state director in special education, and I have kind of a different perspective now because I was there when we did our first alternate and required in 2000, and I was back again in the state um, in 2014 when the, the new core uh, standards were put in place and had to redo and restart that over. So I've kind of seen the gamut of what's gone on um, with alternate and with the general assessment with special ed kids. So I'm going to give you that perspective. And I do want to kind of just comment specifically of personnel, because I came back, I saw a lot of difference and I can't believe that our state is any different than yours. And that's what makes some of this consistency that Vince Tracy were talking about very difficult because the personnel change. So your initial assessment that you might go in for review, have somebody else then um, doing the resubmission. And so you're looking at some different people. And I think both of them, um, added some very special elements to kind of help you look at the consistency 
and look at pulling together different contractors that might be addressing different pieces, um, Vince told you that it's their responsibility as Florida. Um, alternate assessment contractors may be different. So it has to be what Florida wants for their assessment program. It's not a separate program for special ed kids. So um, he made that point, and I think it's good for everybody to remember because we do rely on a lot of our contractors and um, assessment vendors to assist us in lots of ways, but it's still your state responsibility. That's what the feds are looking at. And it's no different than a state looks at your local LEAs when you're telling them test administration, what has to be done, um, you're getting the same look over the shoulder from the Fed. So I think we all want to work together and we all want to be consistent in how we're moving forward, but we run into a lot of different staff, um, different expertise, and that sometimes makes it hard as we go forward. Um, but also, let me say that you've all done a great job. I've reviewed a lot of states. Um, you all do a lot of work that's on top of what you're already doing. So congratulations for all of the work that you've done um, up to this point. And I know you'll obviously continue. So when you're doing a resubmission, you have to kind of look back at what your initial one was um, and the people that were part of that plan as you moved forward, so that when you start reviewing your peer notes and the feedback that you got that you need to now look at for the resubmission, um, it's helpful to get the same team together. If you don't have the same team, um, you have to, it's a now a relearning um, an orientation for some new people to come along and to help you respond to those um, peer notes and, and that's always an issue when you have a lot of different people or it's not coordinated with some type of project management going on, looking at things and one person will do, um, let's say test administration, I'll use Tracy's example, and then forget that there's so many things in that test administration that deal with students with disability, English learners, accommodations. So having one do the section five on special populations and inclusion of kids, and then not have those personnel involved with you when you're doing some of the other critical elements, it just makes it hard and you're not having that consistency and coordination that we've heard from both of our speakers today that is so, it makes your job a lot easier. So. If there's a question on the resubmission that you're not really sure about, I'd encourage you to seek clarification from the Office of Elementary and Secondary Ed. Um, they're very happy to provide additional assistance. They'll get on the phone with your team. They'll help. So please don't prepare materials and have a person by themselves trying to address it when you're not really sure what it is. It's an easy way to get clarification and to move forward. Um, and in your peer notes, hopefully when you were asked to resubmit and there was a, a reason you didn't meet that particular critical element, the peers normally provide some suggestions and examples. You don't have to do them, you may not like them, um, but it's just to give you some ideas on how you could address that critical element. And I think, just about every team that I've been on, they have always provided, here's some way to meet this critical element. So pay attention to that. That can help you a lot in meeting that if you're not sure. And then um, identifying all the required evidence, um, you have your vendors, your TAC, um, and other staff, and you have many states have contractors that are helping them coordinate some of this because you have jobs every day to do that you're working with the field. Um, so sometimes something like this is a little bit extra for you to do. So um, identifying what needs to be done or what needs to be contracted for is part of your whole project management um, process. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, before we move on, Fran, yes. I'd just like to jump in to, to your, your advice on this slide because it triggered uh, Sometimes the peers offer examples and it could be a pretty technical or uh, complex example. And sometimes the state just needs some help understanding it. And we at the department can't always decipher it. And I, 
I can think of multiple times we've gone back to the peers on behalf of the state and said, hey, can you guys flesh this out a little bit more? And peers are, are very helpful to spend a little bit of extra time with basically, um, you know, to provide the explanation to us, which we then pass back to the state. But it, it really does help to seek that clarification. So I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. Good, thank you for adding that. That's nice reinforcement, I appreciate it. Okay, so as we're looking at the resubmission, um, again, it's uh, you're looking at project management and somebody is operating that plan. You need a, a responsible entity to do it. And, and sometimes it's a contractor, sometimes it's a vendor, because if you're like the state I worked in, we, we are all busy. These are all additional things for us to do. And it's helpful to have someone else who's, who's clear on what the items are and we're not doing things at the last minute. Um, and again, I would encourage you very much to have all of your staff within EL and special ed participating with you on any kind of general assessment or any kind of discussion around that. So you can get some of that stuff in the beginning and not at the end and have one person writing one section to try to, when you figure out, oh, we didn't have this section. Oh, let's go to special ed and have them write that piece for us. It's much easier to have it all in the beginning. And then you have the consistency and you have a nice um, improvements in your program going on. Um, please on the um, resubmission, don't send exactly what you did before. Um, I've, I've had that a couple of times. We've all had that. And then we wonder, did they send it because they didn't think we read it the first time or we weren't understanding it? Did we miss something? Um, and there's no notation that we're resending you the same thing that you reviewed before. Um, again, that's a question, a comment into the feds. If you think that the peers didn't understand something that was in the notes, speak up. Um, peers want you to be successful. That No one is there trying to um, make it a, a, a difficult process for you to jump over. We know it's a compliance activity and there are many ways to meet your critical element. How you choose to do that as your state um, that's up to you. No, none of the peers are going to get involved in, they like this better than this. That's your decision. Does it meet it? Does it not? Um, is what the peers are recommending to the federal government as they go forward. So make sure you have the additional information that was asked for that you didn't meet that critical element. No more, don't add extra in here because then that gets people onto another pathway. If you add too much in there, just add what you're asked for um, and add the new information so that you could do that. Um, your review, it's always nice to have an extra review and it's always nice to have someone on the outside review it. And I would certainly encourage you with, again, staffing as it goes to get some of the um, people that are just moving into a new job or sometimes some, some people from the field that you are have doing a lot of work with you on item reviews, on um, reporting requirements, suggestions. Sometimes they are very good because they're, they have to really implement it when it comes down. It's the people on the front lines that are doing it. We're all writing policies and procedures and they do it. So it's really very nice to get other people to review it. They don't have to do a word by word, but just scan it and see anything that jumps out. It's nice feedback for everybody. Okay, next slide, please. And again, just gonna kind of go on that coordination, integration um, area. And these are ones, Tracy used the test administration one. Um, as, as part of where there's a lot of pieces in there and that you wanna make sure you get all those pieces and those pieces have to do with, in addition, students with disability, ELs, um, and the accommodations that you use. And so you always wanna include them, you wanna include them in all your reporting and standard setting meetings so that you have those viewpoints as you're going forward and you're not um, missing out on a big piece of what needs to be done. And I want to go to the monitoring districts Vince mentioned. Um, that's something that you can rely on your special ed people to assist with because they're already doing that. That's one of the requirements they do 
every single year to submit to the other office um, in the federal government. So they can easily expand what they're doing. They have checklists that they're reviewing, the accommodations on the IP, um, were they there, were they there as part of the assessment, all those little pieces that sometimes you miss because you don't look you know, everyone is looking at globally accommodations, but did you make sure it was on the IEP? Was it delivered during test administration as it was listed? There are people that are out monitoring that, monitoring it from afar, looking at the IEPs, know what's going on, and then you can add some other general assessment practices while you're already on site. It's a really um, nice way to pull things together when everyone is kind of stretched to the limit as to what they can do when they're trying to work um, together so that we can improve the system. I, um, I think a lot of it would help um, for kind of just professional development opportunities for people to see some other areas that they're interested in. So when you're doing the the submissions, don't hold it just in the assessment office and think they're the only ones that can do it. There are other people that would like to have their hand in trying some different things. There are people that like to try different things and learn different things. So I'd encourage you to kind of look to who's out in your offices that wants to try to do some new um, information, um, new program areas. Some of them can look to how are they gonna translate into instructional practices, because there are people that really love to do that and are very good and can help you then on the reporting piece because they're in the classroom every day, talking with parents, talking with other teachers and implementing programs. So they're the ones that can give you a lot of feedback as to how this all comes together in, in the school building. So I am finished with my section. Thank you very much for all you've done. And Don, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Fran. So um, at this point, there's been a few questions that have been put into the chat box. Um, and I'm just gonna review them in case folks haven't been following the chat. Uh, there was the question again about the materials from this, this particular webinar. We will share them out uh, to all the registered participants. We'll also post them on our webpage. Uh, and Gretchen, at, when we get to the end, is gonna uh, share the, you know, the URL for our webpage. Uh, and we'll also have this recording. It'll probably take a week or so, but we'll have a link to a video of this recording that'll be prepared um, that folks, if they wanna review it or share it with someone else. Uh, we had a question uh, from Phil Olson, and it was a question, is there a way to make it easier for states to see what other states are doing regarding peer review? Um, saying the decision letters provide some information, but maybe not as much detail. Uh, as I think what Phil would be interested in. And my suggestion to him or to anyone is, we're probably not in a position where we could actually share evidence with everyone from each state uh, that submits for peer review. However, I think any given state might be willing to share some of its evidence or something about its submission with others. And my suggestion to Phil was, uh, we put the peer review notes, appending them at the end of the, the letters to the state, each decision letter. And in those peer notes, there's often references to the state's evidence that was submitted for a given critical element. And that might give you some breadcrumbs to think about. Um, and Don, can, can I suggest one thing? that sure. maybe I, I saw Sandra Warren was on the chat. All of the, the ACES group or all the CCSSO groups can probably do that among themselves, voluntary. If anyone wants to do mm -hmm. that, they could probably coordinate something like that. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good thought. Um, and digging into the peer notes, 
it, if, if your interest is peaked from a given submission, instead of asking a state to see their evidence, maybe if you saw the index that they submitted as part of their peer review submission, that might give you a, an idea because it's kind of an annotated bibliography of what is in the state's submission. And so between the index and the peer notes and the letter, I mean, I'm just kind of winging that, but that might be a suggestion I would make. Um, so there was a question um, from Maureen uh, that was asking if anyone would be willing to share a request for proposals or a statement of work for a TAC that would include assistance with the peer review process, how, how a TAC might support a state. If there's statements of work, I think, for consultants, I'm going to broaden that to help with peer review. Uh, Maureen uh, has her email in the chat uh, at bie.edu. Um, and I think Matt responded, oh, he actually put that right there in the chat box. So he wins a gold star. Um, from South Dakota, Matt from South Dakota provided, I think, some statement of work. Um, and again, this is Fran, I just want to insert that when you're doing the tech, also make sure that you have people there or you run a special one once a year that have special ed backgrounds and EL backgrounds. So you have people that their expertise is in that area so that you can also address those pieces. Yes, and I think Matt said he finally got a gold star um, from, from our office. We give out gold stars. Well, we're doubling the cash award that we gave you last year, uh, Matt, also. Uh, this is Tracy. I'll just add that with regard to technical advisory committees, um, having served on and currently serving on some, um, I'm not sure that the contracts always specifically um, identify peer review as something that the tax- To ensure that our risk- um, I, I think a lot of times it's kind of what Matt shared, it's general language around supporting the technical aspects of the assessment program. And so you would bring studies and ask your technical advisory committee to review them for technical quality um, and make suggestions. And then if what you were looking for is um, a consultant to provide more specific uh, support in your preparation of materials, for peer review, um, whether that be your TAC or someone else, that's probably gonna be a, a separate contract outside the balance of a TAC, if that helps clarify. And sometimes you see the vendor are very happy to serve in that project management role for you on collecting the information. Yeah. If you put it in their contract. Uh, Lynn uh, from New Mexico also posted for uh, Marine some, some information, I think, from uh, New Mexico's uh, statement to works or, or contracts. Uh, so that's, that's very helpful. Thank you, everyone, for sharing those ideas. Are there any other questions? Um, if there are, please put them in, in the chat box and we can circle around before we close, but I'm gonna ask uh, Gretchen to kind of, uh, not kind of, to kind of <laughs> wrap this up and summarize. Sure. So the next slide includes links to all of the forthcoming webinars. Uh, there will be one held um, in a couple of weeks on July 29th, and that will be more of a deep dive into critical elements 5.4 and 6.4. Um, there will be a webinar on August 12th that will also be a deep dive, but on critical elements 2.1 and 3.1. And we have decided to focus on those critical elements collectively in the deep dive because those tend to be the ones that um, 
can be the most complicated um, and um, the most challenging. And so we, we hope that those sessions will try to untangle some of that and, and make it more clear about what, um, what it is that needs to be submitted and shared. Um, and then the last webinar, I would say is sort of similar to this one. Um, Vince and Tracy and Fran offered, I think some tips and tricks um, along the way and just generally great feedback to consider. Um, and webinar four will, will also do something along those lines um, from different perspectives. So those Thank links you. are all there. I'm sorry, Don, were you gonna say? No, something? it was just me, Kathy Banks. Um, also part of the assessment team with Gretchen and uh, Don. We also wanted to point out that the upcoming web webinar, webinar number two, will actually have an activity that the participants can take part in where we'll have some actual evidence um, from a particular state that allowed us to use that evidence. And we would ask you to do an activity where you would create a mock submission index as if you were submitting evidence for peer review and um, you know, provide a rationale for the evidence. Um, actually, let me rephrase that. You'll have the evidence and you'll put it together as if you were submitting um, for an assessment peer review. And then for webinar four, where you see debrief, our expert panelists will actually take a look at that evidence as well. And they'll indicate whether or not that evidence uh, is sufficient for that particular critical element. And we have 5.4 and 6.4 are the two that we're gonna be focusing on. So webinar two will be a chance for you to take part in an activity where you'll create a submission index based on evidence that one of our states allowed us to use for this activity. So we hope you can join us for webinar two and then webinar four would be the debrief of that. Great. Um, next slide is, um, as Dawn mentioned, here are some resources if you don't have these bookmarked already. Um, just a link to our page where you'll be able to find the webinar and slides within the next week, but we will be sending you the slides uh, following this meeting. Um, also a link to the peer review materials um, and a previous assessment seminar and video that was done in 2018. Um, and then a link to another resource that we think is really helpful um, in sort of understanding and unpacking all of the information um, that we've discussed today. So with that, um, if there are no other questions, um, I would like to thank all of you for participating today and for your attention. And a special thanks to our panelists, Fran and Vince and Tracy um, for lending their time to, to this conversation. Don, is there anything else you would like to add? No, again, I just wanna echo uh, Gretchen's thanks. And um, we, we continue to be um, surprised and pleased with the participation that we get in these webinars that we've offered. We had well over 100 participants that have registered for all four of these webinars. And um, I know it's not as nice as coming to DC for a two day session in a hotel, which is what we did in 2018. But um, all that being said, it's still uh, an opportunity to kind of share information and we appreciate that opportunity. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thanks. I think we're gonna end the webinar now, folks. Okay.